If you're looking for a trusted source of natural supplements, look no further than NutritionW.com. Since 1979, Nutrition World has been a staple in the Chattanooga community with dedicated research specialists that stay ahead of the trends to make sure you have the most reliable products available at the most competitive prices. All of their supplements are vetted for quality, effectivity, and potency and shipped with the utmost care with cold packs included in each and every order. You can shop online now at nutritionw.com slash shop and choose from thousands of your favorite supplements, sports nutrition, pet, and specialty food products today. Nutrition World, partners on your wellness journey. Hey listeners, welcome back to the Holistic Navigator podcast, where we believe in the body's ability to heal itself if it's given the proper nutrition and care it deserves. My name is Brian Strickland. I'm the producer of the show, and here with me in the studio, as always, is your host, Ed Jones. On today's episode, we're incredibly excited to have Matt Davis join us. Matt is an IFBB Pro bodybuilder and owner of the Train Station Gym in Hickson, Tennessee. Matt lives and breathes training and spends his days competing and helping others reach their full potential in the gym, all while following a completely natural and healthy diet and supplement regimen. We're going to talk to Matt about some of his favorite methods to get in the best possible shape, and while there's work to be done in the gym, much of what Matt does happens outside of the gym. And on that note, that's it for me. Let's get this episode rolling. Here's the host of the show, Mr. Ed Jones. Thank you, Brian, and welcome back to the Holistic Navigator here with Ed Jones. Uh, Got about 76 chapters under our belt now. Uh, Topics, everything you can imagine. Believe it or not, the number one most requested one is constipation. But we've got everything from hair loss to uh, working out, losing body fat, thyroid issues, blood blood pressure, whatever you want with a natural perspective, you can certainly find it here on the Holistic Navigator. Today's going to be quite interesting, uh, totally different than any other podcast I have done uh, in the previous couple years, and it's dealing with a gentleman that I have known now for several years, Matt Davis. He's an IFBB pro bodybuilder, and I'm talking professional, and he's a personal trainer. He has a business here in Chattanooga, Tennessee called The Train Station, been a bodybuilder for 20 years, but he's not just a normal bodybuilder. He is, and I don't mean this to be too derogatory, he's a very intelligent and wise bodybuilder. I have been around this field of lifting weights, gyms, and bodybuilding since 1972, and I find that the vast majority of men especially do not value health. That is totally different with Matt Davis. He understands the whole gamut of how to build muscle, how to lose body fat, and also how to be healthy. What I want to really focus on today is is I will call it contest preparation, but truly what this uh, next 30 minutes should teach you is how can we prepare for a certain date or event to have the best looking physique we can with muscle and fat loss and tone and size, everything that Matt Davis has done to prepare for all of his professional and amateur contest where you can walk on stage and look your absolute best for that day. Because, you know, bodybuilding isn't like super popular, but this will apply to bodybuilders. But it also is going to apply if you have a wedding or you want to go to the beach or you're going to do a photo shoot, or you just are super motivated to set a goal of three months from now, I want to look like uh, different than I do now. And so welcome to the Holistic Navigator, Matt Davis. Thank you so much, Ed. It's great to be here. And I've uh, certainly been a big fan of the podcast myself and use it many times as a reference source. So thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. Wonderful compliment. I, I have to learn to shut up because sometimes I talk too much the first eight minutes, but I've got one little story I've got to tell. I want everybody, and most people listening probably can't do what I'm going to say, which is go back to 1972. That was when I was uh, a scrawny little fella. I went to a local high school that was very troubled, and I had lunch money stolen probably three out of five days and was picked on constantly because, one reason, I weighed 119 pounds at 5'11". 
And sometime during 1972, my father had purchased a membership to Cosmopolitan Spa, an old-fashioned spa that actually we had men's days and women's days. You couldn't blend the two back in the 70s. So on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, I worked, started working out at Cosmopolitan Spa. Well, they measured me when I first went in, as you may do with your clients. My upper arm was 10 and a quarter inches, and I weighed 119 pounds, literally a bean pole. Well, within about eight weeks, I had become addicted to weight training and the vision that I could see. And in three years, which was 1975, I had gained about 80 pounds, most of it muscle with no steroids. And I did it through food, some of it very unhealthy, I will admit, a lot of, lot, a lot of milk and sometimes some fried foods because I didn't know. You know, it was all about just packing the belly so you could gain mass. And, you know, I continued this process here. I am 63. I've never left the gym except for the five weeks of quarantine since I was uh, since 1972. So what I want to talk to you today, Matt, about is and my physique was was I've never been heavy and I've always had a small waist, but I was really not low body fat. I ended up being just your average guy that had a little bigger arms than normal and I could bench a little more than most people. But I I just, and I look like I kind of worked out, but with my shirt off, it wasn't anything at all different than average. Here I am 63. I measured my body fat yesterday and it was 10.2%. I think it's pretty dang good because I have learned only in the past five years how to do this, because here's what happens to most people. If they lose weight, they lose muscle. All these people dieting, they're not going to look much better if they have a bathing suit on, if they've lost muscle, if they're losing weight. And secondly, many times this applies to guys, I want to get bigger. So when they gain size, they gain fat. And I think you won't disagree with that, Matt. So I'm going to turn this more over to you now. What do we tell the men and women who have a goal in mind as far as diet, training, other lifestyle habits that will help them get to a goal, which like you have done 20 plus times, make sure you're very best on that day. So I'm going to shut up for a minute and let you talk. I would say number one, Ed, uh, and I try to do this routinely myself, is what I practice, is number one, forget everything that you thought you knew and be open your mind up to learn new things. And the, one of the things I see plaguing people when they're trying to transform their body. And and when I use that term bodybuilding, uh, we're going to say it's the pursuit to build more muscle and lose body fat. Uh, and that gets it a little away from the competitive side. So anybody that's interested in doing those things, uh, I think absolutely has the right to use that word. I'm bodybuilding. I'm trying to build muscle and lose fat. Um, but a lot of people, I think, get caught up in their their counting macros, and there's you know there's diet plans out there like if it fits your macros, as long as you have this much fat and this many carbs and this much protein, even if it's from a McDonald's bagel, and you know uh, I actually <laughs> read an article a number of years ago where they deemed that a quarter pounder from McDonald's was a better option. Uh, than an uh, an apple with uh, peanut butter on it because the macros lined up better for what they and I think we can agree that that's a that's a terrible <laughs> option <laughs> and, a, and a choice so I think people get lost in some of these metrics of and then also in the gym you go and you want to know how many sets do I need to do or how many reps do I need to do and that's far less important than just finding exercises and feelings that work well for you. Um, So I think the first step is kind of forget about some of these mainstream concepts and metrics that we, we feel like we have to do and we have to follow and, and focus on quality oriented stuff. And so from that perspective, I always present people with kind of four concepts to build themselves on. And and it's kind of in a pyramid fashion. And these are in order. The broadest foundation of the pyramid is actually breathing. And that sounds, you know, lighthearted and hokey and this and that. Um, and I won't get too deep into that, but I would encourage people to educate themselves on breathing. I think you did a holistic navigator only on breathing. So yes, I'd highly, yes, I did. highly recommend people go back and 
deep dive a little bit on what breathing techniques can do for you health wise. I'm going to also extrapolate that into, uh, you know, the second layer would then be sleep. If you're not breathing properly, then you're not going to sleep well. So that negates that. Uh, as fitness people, you know, we're also told you need to eat all these small frequent meals and we typically live a high stress lifestyle. We're training a lot. We're doing life. We're probably burning the candle. So we tend to be in this fight or flight stage most of the time in the sympathetic nervous system. Breathing can be a very effective tool at dialing that back. And what we do know is you don't digest your food properly when you're wound up, when you're in fight or flight, you're just not going to die. So it doesn't matter how much protein you eat. It doesn't matter how many fat you, if you're not digesting it well, so what? So some good breathing practices can help before each meal. Like I tell people, invest five minutes in calming yourself down doing some deep breathing, doing some box breathing, nasal breathing before you eat your meal. And that will totally prepare your body to uptake those nutrients that you're, you're putting in. So it drastically affects your nutrition. Uh, from the training side, um, there are, um, there's two guys. There's one named Patrick McEwen and uh, Brian McKenzie's. If, if people can Google them and look at some of their work, they got tons of videos up, but they talk about the performance enhancing benefits of breathing, uh, even to the tune of nasal breathing and how you can trigger the aerobic pathway. So for the fat loss, you know, people, your antenna goes up when you hear aerobics, you think fat loss, uh, you can influence that with the way you breathe while you're doing it. Um, and you can also influence and enhance the anaerobic pathway when you're lifting weights by breathing a, a slightly different way. Um, so let me, breathing let, let me interrupt huge. you one second because I love you're one of the few people I've ever, ever spoke to who understands the value of proper breathing. And many people have been brought up actually with the wrong idea, which is super deep, fast breathing. And and that's actually not the healthiest way. I encourage people to go back to my holistic navigator, listen to the one on breathing. But you and I both, I think, totally agree that the, the this system called the parasympathetic sympathetic is kind of where the fight and flight syndrome comes in or the calming part. Everything in our human body it has a balancing uh, almost thermostat to it. And so if we're wired totally due to stress and other lifestyle problems, uh, the part of us, the parasympathetic needs to kick in in order to calm that system down. And breathing is the ultimate way to do that. I do feel that Dr. Buteko, who is a Russian doc, had a really cool uh, take on this breathing, which is slow the breath down. He actually wants us to breathe about eight times a minute. And also, and, and I know we've all joked about this, the thing I started pushing six years ago was taping your mouth shut at night because mouth breathing is devastates your health. In fact, I say this on the other podcast, uh, there's only about four animals in nature that can live with a crushed nose. That's, and dogs and cats can for some reason, but a giraffe or uh, some of the zebras and all this, if they have a crushed nose and they mouth breathe, they will be dead in four weeks. That's because of exactly what you're talking about. So thank you for being my fan of breathing. And it isn't something hokey that we just all dismiss. This is vital to balance this system for everything, not just your physique, but for your health, your mental health, your anxiety. So uh, uh, please listen to my holistic navigator on breathing and do some more research on it. And I encourage taping your mouth shut. We And nutritionw.com is the sponsor of Holistic Navigator. And on there, they sell the tape that you can use for taping your mouth shut at night. And once you do it for five nights, I promise you people, you'll, you'll never go without it. I have turned my car around and gone back to my apartment in order to get that tape if I'm on a trip. That's how important it is. I agree 100%. I actually propose that to people that I am coaching that are competing. Uh, and believe it or not, that is the hardest thing to get people to do is to tape their mouth. It's low hanging fruit. <laughs> I mean, come on for the return you get on that investment might be the biggest one I, th I think I've ever seen. But I, I tell guys, um, you know, diet, check, training, check, sleeping, it's getting better. You know, everything's great. 
are you taping your mouth? And if they tell me no, I say, well, get ready to lose. And, mm. and, and we're talking, when we're talking about competition, I rate that on, are you able to achieve your best? Not what the actual placings at the show are, but did you come in at your best? And I feel strongly enough about that, that if you're not taping your mouth shut, then you're, you're not taking being at your best very seriously. I love that because we are, and so often we get into this competition with so many other people in the world, but truly the only competitor that is super important is yourself. To be better than what you used to be is the noble path in life. So let's move on to peer number two. Peer uh, number two is sleep. So we touched on that a little bit, and I think you did a holistic navigator also on that, yeah. which is very well. So I won't get into the details on the supplement side of that. I would encourage people to go back and listen to that. But uh, I personally utilize a, a, a specific supplement regimen to go to uh, enhance and make sleep more productive, as well as try to practice good sleep hygiene, uh, particularly in the evening time. And so that generally includes blue blocking glasses. Bingo. After a certain time, I try to stay off of screens or at least minimize it as much as I can in the second half of the day. Uh, And there again, doing some breathing before I go to sleep to kind of wind myself down. Uh, and things like that. But if you're not sleeping, that's where your recovery is. So when people, when you want to build the best body of your dreams, the first question is usually, well, how many days should I work out and how many meals should I eat? And my reply to that is you got to work on your sleep because neither of those things matter a whole lot. Uh, and it's going to dictate a lot. If you're not sleeping well, that person may only tolerate two or three days in the gym, max. Because it's digging into recuperative powers, right? Exactly. Uh, I personally love training. Uh, I have to dial myself back many times because I, I would train six days or seven and multiple times a day if I can. I enjoy it. It's fun. But I also realize that it that can get very unproductive as well if the sleep is not in line to support that. Can I ask your age, Matt? Uh, I'll be about to be 45. Okay. Yeah. And you would you just wouldn't believe the uh, quality physique that he has, too. So that's... Uh, and, and again, we're t- these both of these topics not only make you your best physique wise, but your best health wise, and most likely will extend your lifespan, especially of quality years. So, uh, and and I admit that I my chronic uh, issue is is often on ins- insomnia. That's why I'm so good at helping other people. I do believe, and it is a management issue, especially when you get past fifty five to sixty. It's not like you're going to have a fix fix. It's a management. Uh, technique that you have to come up with that, okay, tonight I'm feeling this way, so I'm going to do this and that. But I'm, I want to reiterate what you said about blue light. Blue light after 6 p.m. at night, if you're a normal go to better at 9 to 10 to 11, is going to disrupt the brain chemistry that will decrease the quality of sleep. And I, you know, luckily I have a, a new iPhone that has the blue blocker you can switch on, and I do that at 6 o'clock. Uh, I don't watch TV after six o'clock and I do have the glasses if I did watch TV. So thank you for that. So next. Right. And, and I don't want people to, I know a lot of the, if there are any bodybuilders out there listening to this, I hope they, they can take this for what it is and realize how important. And I speak these because I've learned the hard way, as you said, your story, you ate a lot of bad food coming. We all did that. And that's one way you learn some of these things. So I, I also at one time thought, uh, that's, you know, uh, uh, if you don't breathe, you die. As long as I'm getting air in, I'll be fine. I uh, feel like I'm in the bed for a certain amount of time. I'll be fine. You really got to work to optimize these things. Okay. The next one and the next two, the nutrition and then the training, that's what most people really want to talk about the most. Um, you know, so, but, you know, let's understand you're not going to get the most out of those if you're not optimizing your breathing and your, your sleeping first. Um, the nutrition though, it's, it's impossible to give specifics because um, everybody's going to be a little bit different. And when we look at the characteristics of um, how much of each macro do you need, uh, my general outlook is a low or moderately low carbohydrate approach. And, and same here. And here's why. If you're not managing your insulin, and this touches on the the point that you brought up earlier about if you're going to bulk up, you people usually get fat. And when they cut down, they usually gain muscle. That is directly tied to your ability to be insulin sensitive. 
Um, if you're really, really insulin sensitive, you can gain a lot of muscle and lo- get really, really lean. Uh, if you're more insulin resistant, the weight you put on is going to tend to be more fat and you're going to have a heck of a time trying to get that body fat off if you don't address those insulin issues. So, and I want to, I want to, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I want to say that Everyone listening, when you go get your physical, none of you have ever had an insulin test. And if you want to do that, because you're going to have to take on yourself some of these uh, chemistry and blood issues, because uh, physicians are very poorly skilled at any of this conversation. In fact, Matt, again, it's a breath of fresh air for me to have someone like you who has studied the implications of insulin. I probably have said the word insulin on 40 out of my 76 podcast. It is a key component along with the Omega-3 for your long-term health. You want insulin at two and under for optimal everything. How do we get a test? You can do it if you find a practitioner locally, but if not, go to the Holistic Navigator under products. You just scroll down to Direct Labs and order an insulin test. There's no excuse for not having this knowledge today. So yes, continue on, my friend. Uh, and, and to further that point, I will testify, I have never seen a person get into a competition ready type of state where the the body fat is very low doing it, you know, in kind of a drug free manner. I mean, there, there are people out there that can eat a thousand carbs a day and their insulin sky high and they take enough fat burners and thermogenics to maybe, uh, temporarily bypass that. And, and that's the key word temporarily, but to do it the healthy way, uh, and please people don't buy into the idea that, you have to do some of those things to acquire that. It's not true at all, but you do have to follow the laws of nature. And that is having those low insulin levels. You you will not have low body fat without also having low insulin levels. Bingo. It's just not happening. It's not happening. Um, so that is a, a whole key. So uh, there's many strategies and many tools you can incorporate that from fasting to different uh, nutritional interventions, but generally uh, controlling it. Now, I will tell this, when I'm close to being in the shape that I want to be, like for me to be on stage at a professional level, it's got to be around the 5% mark, maybe even a little bit 5% less. 5% body fat. 5% body fat. And when I'm at 5% body fat, lo and behold, I can tolerate a tremendous amount of carbohydrates at that percent body fat because I am very insulin sensitive at that point. As I back out of that and maybe I'm at seven, now I need less carbs, 10%. I can now I can tolerate even less carbs. So generally I advocate some sort of cyclical plan where you're not all one way or the other, you know, so just for me personally, which is kind of my normal lifestyle diet and, and I try to stay in close to top shape most of the time is uh, some days I have a fair amount of carbs, which for me and my age would be around my body weight. So 250 for me, that's about how much I weigh. That would be a high carbohydrate day. Uh, on a day where maybe I don't train or I need to cycle down low anyway, I go almost complete. I'm not going to say keto, but keto like where my desired number is the lowest I can get. Uh, Now, the other component of that real quick would be regardless of how you're handling those carbohydrates in relation to insulin, the other huge tool that you have to have in place is adequate essential fats. Bodybuilders chronically like to do the low fat diet. That is not a long term solution. You may can lose some body fat and get lean temporarily. But as you start having these health breakdowns and metabolic breakdowns, um, it's you're going to be eating less and less calories, less and less food. Your skin's not going to be healthy. Your hair's going to fall out, and you're going to wonder why. And you're going to get fatter. And it's probably because you may not be taking in enough essential fat. So I prefer to try to get as much of those healthy fat options from the diet. Give us some examples of the foods you eat to get those fats. So obviously you have your superfood stuff like avocados. I think really high quality olive oil, and you got to be careful about the quality. So good quality olive oil from plant sources. Um, uh, But I, I would also encourage people to not completely 
be terrified of naturally occurring saturated fats from really high quality pasture raised meat sources. And butter. And butter. Yes. I use a People would freak out if they knew how much butter and whole eggs I yes. eat. And my lipid profile is is always great. Um, so high quality, naturally occurring. And then I also have to throw in the omega-3s, which I do believe everyone has to supplement because you're not going to get those. I think you also did a holistic navigator on that. So I would encourage people to deep dive on why that's important. There's really only two or three supplements I consider completely necessary at all times. And that's omega-3 and magnesium. So those tie into the, and those are the two, I think it's just, let's just say it's impossible to get an adequate amount of either of those from a, no matter how good your diet is, you're probably Absolutely. not going to do that. You almost cannot. And, and we do blood testing for all of those. And it's amazing how many people who eat very healthy and look great, still are low on that. Now, I know this is going sideways. You know, you and I both know Adam Chauncey. I really think he's a walking encyclopedia, and he uh, encourages me to kind of the athletic supplement thing because I'm not a huge fan of actually supplements for for training in the gym. I do very little. I do everything from building my momentum of, of regular health, which then, of course, distills down into better uh, gym performance, which then makes, of course, better physique. Uh, but I did start back on using branch chain and a small amount of creatine because I tend to have a real problem uh, building muscle size. And so uh, those are OK, aren't they? Branch chain after a workout and about five grams of creatine is what I'm doing now. I, I do love both of those. Uh, the creatine, I, I think, can be dependent on maybe how much beef someone is. Gotcha. And, and, and I, I like to rotate my meats. So I have days where I'm eating two or three servings of beef. I have days where I don't eat any. Mm -hmm. So a creatine supplement is is critical on some days for me. Okay. Um, for the amino acids, I'm a big fan of the essential amino acids because what we know from the muscle building is the branch chains are kind of the trigger, but you do need the other essentials to kind of make it all go. Um, now, I will say this. Um, if your overall protein intake is adequate, and it's tough to put a number on that, I would say if you're gaining muscle and you're feeling good, it's probably adequate. Um, if you're not it may be worth looking at increasing. Um, well, and, I, and I hate to be nosy. How much protein per pound of body weight do you try to do for, for I don't know, maybe give me both uh, maintenance and also for preparation? You know, the data suggests you're going to see great benefit from around uh, about a gram of protein per pound of lean body weight. Uh, yeah, I do think people tend to overdo that sometimes. Now, I do think there's high value in going through phases and, and the value being on gaining the muscle in going above that. So many times I'll go uh, muscle weight times 1.5 or even times 0.2 for a short period of time, maybe eight weeks. And that can really catapult your progress in the gym temporarily. I don't think that's a great lifestyle healthy eating plan, I think. And, and I have great success maintaining muscle mass on much lower protein than that. So uh, you kind of have to clarify, are you happy to maintain? Or are you very aggressively pursuing more muscle mass? That kind of answers the question on how much protein, but about a, a gram per pound of lean body weight should be enough to build muscle. I like that idea. And I do go through cycles where I actually do probably a half a gram, and then, but then I generally am about close to three-fourths of a gram to one gram. I don't feel that I need a whole lot above that. In fact, I'm sitting here, and I'm sure you know this guy, Dr. Sean Baker. Absolutely. Uh, he's on Instagram, has some great things. He's very tied into a very high diet of a lot of protein. And there's a lot of controversy about protein. Oh, is it going to hurt my kidneys? Does it cause increased cancer rates and, and many other issues? One is, I know you'd all too well, Matt, you're choosing as best you can, the grass-fed, uh, antibiotic-free, you fix a lot at home. Uh, I don't. That's one of my uh, other issues is I have to eat out a lot. So I have to be just satisfied with what I can get. But you are doing cleaner meats. And I think a lot of the problems come from the uh, the terrible conditions they raise chickens in, the, um, the, the cages and the antibiotics. And, of course, cows are given a lot of drugs. That's why we know that antibiotics make 
all people, including people and animals, fatter. That's why they give it to cows. Well, we're getting some of the, those antibiotics. And so that's scary because, again, it's hard to be in contest shape if you're taking antibiotics because it's making you fat. So you live a clean life. So I don't want people to think they can get the the, 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 the McDonald's burger, pull it off the bun and eat Absolutely it. Absolutely not. Uh, and uh, to extrapolate on that even more, when you're eating uh, what I would call industrialized food, uh, those animals are predominantly eating genetically modified corn and soy, which will yield a much higher percentage of polyunsaturated fats. That's probably the other big component of insulin resistance. Uh, and it's going to just cause all kind of problems. To Generally, uh, you know, if you eat an all natural diet on pasture raised animals, your percentage of polyunsaturated fat is probably going to be two or three percent. Most Americans are probably in the 30 to 40 percent neighborhood. And, 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 the, and the things that have polyunsaturated fats is basically all vegetable oils, uh, canola, safflower, all the way down the list. Uh, avocado doesn't if it's good quality. Olive oil doesn't. Uh, but, you know, olive oil, you have to be cautious where you can't cook it at high temperatures or it goes rancid. But most things you eat are being made with very poor oils. I mean, just go to the grocery store and look at salad dressings. Canola, 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 canola on almost every single thing. And I may be taken for granted that we all know that is an absolute no no. Absolutely. On, even on my worst day, I will not consume any processed vegetable oil. That, that is a pure poison. Uh, that and sodas and cigarettes are the, <laughs> those are the big three poisons in my well, book. But even in some of the meats, I think it's important to think the animal that I'm eating, well, what did they eat? Did bingo. they eat those same oils or the ingredients those oils are derived from? So uh, you can certainly have those toxins and those, those bad things passed down to you if you consume enough of those products. I like that because the very last podcast I did with uh, – um, the lady from Garden of Life, the trainer, she said, you are what your foods eat. And I love that the way, and you just rephrased it because – what we're getting in our foods is basically what was fed to the food that we're now eating if it's a live animal. And that's why omega-3s are essential because we cannot get the level any longer of those healthy foods. And those those foods are going to create so much better health, memory, less body fat, less triglycerides, better insulin. Everything you'd want is found in the proper dosing and proper brand of omega-3. And again, nutritionw.com, we, we are vetting or they're vetting every single product to make sure it's of the quality. And they also ship with ice packs in the summer. Don't believe that your omega-3s are fine ordered from Amazon sitting in a warehouse and five days later you get them in the middle of summer. They're going to be partially rancid due to the heat. So be cautious, people. Well, we got a, a, just a few minutes left. So what else? One, one last point on that. And this is the, the people when you're talking about gaining fat and losing muscle, and you touched on that again, but to drive that home, the great news is if you really prioritize the quality of your food, the foods that are going to help you build this great muscle mass and respond to the stimulus you're creating in the gym are the exact same foods that are going to help you address the insulin Mm -hmm. And the getting lean part of it. So this this old time, I'm going to bulk up and cut down and bulk up and cut down. And that's old news. That's not how all the, the top guys are doing it anymore. You're, you're, you're on a consistent, high quality diet all the time. And you may go through phases where you're you're eating more of that good food to try to gain muscle. And you may go through phases where you're eating slightly less of that same food. But there's no... F Food differences. You, you, you're not going in one direction and then say, oh, it's time to bulk uh -huh. up. Let's go through the drive through At no point do, will, will I endorse that type of behavior. And a lot of people love this bulking and cutting. And to me, it's just an excuse to uh, just go cheat on their diet and eat a bunch of crap. Yep. That There's no physiological demand for crap food. Um, Every time in my past that I uh, embraced that philosophy – my waist went up two inches every right. single time. And, and that goes well beyond worrying about counting calories and all of this. All of these underlying things we're talking about manifest themselves from the quality of your food. And you're going to see great results from great quality, or you're going to see not too good and poor results from low quality food. Gotcha. Well, touch real quickly on the gym. What do people need to think about as far as the training program, even though you're not going to do that right now, but give us some bullet points. Uh, two key components, obviously, the cardiovascular aerobic portion of your training and then also the muscle building anaerobic 
portion of your training. The number one thing I would encourage people to think about is if muscle building is your goal, really streamline your thought process of what am I training for performance versus actual muscle building. And the whole key to muscle building is to apply tension and stress into a target muscle. It's not to complete a certain amount of reps. It's not to uh, get to a performance threshold. And, and I'll use myself as an example. Uh, if, if you give me uh, the right amount of money, I would really like to think I could give you somewhere between 40 and 50 pull-ups um, if, if we're just counting reps. Now, from a muscle building perspective, if I back that down, I'm going to get my best muscle building response probably from six, seven, eight reps. After that, I'm doing something else. Uh, so I'm. So you want to focus on the muscle. You want to think about what muscle am I training? Is the exercise I'm doing doing a good job of putting the tension in that target muscle? And then I would call that a good exercise if the answers are yes. If the answers are no, maybe you're doing, say, squats. I will tell you this, and I'm a big, I've been a big squatter historically. I've never had to stop doing a set of squats because it's my quads that are burning so much. So if I do a squat and say, I want to maximally build my quads, and I have to stop the set because my back is hurting, or I'm about to pass out because I can't breathe, or I can't maybe there's a better tool to target that muscle. So from a muscle building, bodybuilding perspective on muscle, it's about targeting. So, uh, and I, I can't give specifics, um, but I can encourage people to be open-minded, be willing to try any exercise. If it looks like it might work, give it a try. Uh, Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. And also don't be beholden to what I call the golden calves. Uh, I know a lot of people that have spent years and years under the barbell squatting and it's brutally and they never really built the legs they wanted because it just wasn't the best exercise for them. Mm, that's um, such wise wisdom. And here's the deal. I've been in the gym again since 1972 and, and I think you won't <laughs> disagree with me. Now, you own a gym, the train station, which is different than what I'm about to speak. But I have, other than the five weeks of quarantine, I, I'm an observer of people. 90% of all people I see who come to the gym three and four days a week never improve. They don't. They get better as far as health, probably, cardiovascular. Their physique never improves. In fact, it starts sliding as the years go on, again, because they're not addressing the actual things that you have just spoke about, the nutrition, the training, the insulin, the blank, blank, blank. So, and I think people who are in gyms will also agree with me. It's very rare, even with personal trainers. There's a, there's a guy at the gym right now who's been personal trained for a year and a half. His clients getting fatter and fatter all the time. So, you know, and I think a lot of it is we have these stigmas that we're beholden to. You have to bench press. You have to do squats. You have to do this. You have to do that. You have to, you don't have to do anything. Uh, the gym is your toolbox. There you go. There's nothing wrong with a hammer, but if you have a Phillips head screw, it's going to be a lot more, <laughs> you have a lot easier time putting that screw in if you have the right screwdriver. So look at every exercise as your tool. And if you, over time, you hopefully acquire a fairly decent sized toolbox and you have a lot of tools that you can use, but don't restrict yourself to just a handful and think that's going to get the job done. Cause everybody's, you know, nail and screw size and the, the job is, is going to be different for all of us with our proportions and our genetics and our age and what's appropriate as far as loads. Um, so it's really about choosing the right tool for your job. And I would also, the last thing is encourage people every workout, every set, and maybe every rep, ask yourself, why am I doing this? You need to answer that question. And then is what I'm doing helping me in this, you know, so uh, take something like box jumps. I absolutely love box jumps for what they are and what they're good for. Are they going to help you build bodybuilder quads? And eh, probably not. There's probably a better tool for that. Um, but kind of recognizing and learning to recognize what exercises are for what purposes that's huge. So I would definitely recommend trying to work with someone that's qualified and probably has good experience and a good resume of 
you know, if, if they have clients and they themselves look like and the goals that you want to achieve, that's a good indicator. You know, hopefully they have some education and some background to go with that. But a lot of the education you get in the gym comes from being in the gym. Absolutely. What And that has got some great points to it, one of which is find people who really know their stuff. And that requires a little bit of work because not everyone does just because they have a title. Uh, and I certainly say this constantly about conventional medicine. They're wonderful people in the system, but they don't have the toolbox. They don't know about nutrition. They don't know about intermittent fasting. They don't know about all these things that, that you're well-schooled in and finding that person or, and you know, again, you can learn on your own, but it's slower because you make many mistakes along the path. I will say, and you said something a little bit earlier about, you know, like the box jumps. Well, I did, um, I did the, uh, what's the one, uh, the, 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 uh, jumps on the floor where I'm squatting down and then I jump up. Oh, like the burpees. Yeah, burpees. I did burpees this morning. Uh, I do them every other week. I also like a guy named Frank Madrano. I do his workout on Wednesdays. And so on Monday, Tuesday, I do the weights. Wednesday, I do Madrano. Thursday and Friday, I do weights again. I do have to do heavy because I'm, I'm thin and I need to maintain muscle. So I have found my niche through a lot of mistakes, as you have and other people in, in your field that are experts. I am going to experiment, which I did yesterday, again, with blood restriction training bands. I'm going to do a podcast on that in the next few months, uh, and and maybe you and I could uh, partner on that. I would love to talk to. Uh, I'm becoming more and more of a fan, and it's, especially as we're all getting older, uh-huh. um, I think we all know, man. If I lift really heavy, I can build a big muscle. Well, what if maybe lifting heavy is not the best thing for you right now at this time at an age? Or I know I certainly don't lift near what I did 10 years ago, uh, but I feel like I can still build plenty of muscle because I have a better toolbox. There you go. And, and that's one of them. And the, the Elicit Navigator is here to build a toolbox. And and lastly, uh, we have a machine uh, locally called Sika, which we put a lot of people on, which is a state-of-the-art body fat machine that can truly uh, define where you are and where you're going. So I would encourage people to, to utilize that machine, uh, whether it be uh, here locally or in your own town. It's about $15 to get checked on it. But if you do it every two weeks, you truly know where you're going, and then you can readjust before you just waste too much time. Well, Matt, it's been a, a totally informative, and I know people are going to be uh, thrilled to death to take on some of these pieces of advice that you've given. Uh, tell me a little, or tell listeners how where you're located in case people were close to Chattanooga and they wanted to access your amazing uh, experience. Uh, our facility, the train station, is located just north of the Chattanooga city limits. We're actually in Hickson. Uh, so the locals will be familiar with that. Uh, probably the best way for the mass majority of people to reach out is through social media. I'm just Matt Davis on Facebook. And if you find that, you'll see the big train station banner and the, the bodybuilding pictures and same thing on Instagram, which is Matt Davis, IFBB pro. Um, so I'm certainly open to answer questions via private messages and, and getting out more information. And sometimes just, uh, if, if somebody just needs a tip on, you know, maybe, you know, what is a good source of monounsaturated fat, mm-hmm. I'll give you my favorite. <laughs> That's wonderful. And you can email me also at the Holistic Navigator, and I will pass any questions that you have along to Matt Davis. Thank you, Matt, for taking your time, that you're a busy man, to join me uh, on the Holistic Navigator. And I know uh, I don't know anyone who knows about blood restriction training except you. And I'm being the guinea pig, as I do many times in my life, about health. And so let's just kind of mentally shoot for about two months from now. I'd love for you to, uh, you and I, partner on this education of people on this blood restriction. It's really where you put bands on, you restrict the blood appropriately, and you're right. What you can do, especially as we're getting older, you could take your weights down by 40, maybe 50% to 60% and get just as much or more results from your training. That means literally no injuries. 
because injuries come generally from proper improper technique and too much weight. Every injury I've ever had is basically due to that. Or the other one was due to super stretching before I did a heavy weight, which I've talked about. I, I do not recommend stretching a lot before weight training. I recommend after. But thank you, Matt Davis. And Absolute pleasure. Thank you. All right. And to all the listeners, uh, another great episode from the Elastic Navigator. Please stay tuned for we've got a whole page of, of ideas that I have for future ones. And please recommend us to your friends. And if you need any product, nutritionw.com is the source for all the quality products that we speak about or others that you may read about. Have a healthy and safe day to everyone. And thank you for listening to the Holistic Navigator. The information on this podcast and the topics discussed have not been evaluated by the FDA or anyone of the medical profession and is not aimed to replace any advice you may receive from your medical practitioner. The Holistic Navigator assumes no responsibility or liability whatsoever on behalf of any purchaser or listener of these materials. The Holistic Navigator is not a doctor, nor does it claim to be. Please consult your physician before beginning any health regimen.